The term telos refers to an ultimate aim, and it is often defined as end, or goal, and left at that. This unfortunate oversimplification of a complex concept lends itself to much confusion because any action can be directed toward an end goal, and so the robust concept is too often reduced to speak merely of ends justifying means, which is why ethicists often present teleological theories in contrast to deontological theories, for which a seemingly good end can never serve as justification for an apparently unjust means. Utilitarianism and egoism both, in this narrow sense, qualify as teleological ethical theories. The end goal of egoism is self-interest. The end goal of utilitarianism is majority satisfaction. Alas, these are questionable ends, and the question hangs upon the way the world is, the design or end goal for the created order, including the nature and purpose of human beings as moral agents and social creatures. Now this is a teleological question, but it is not concerned merely with the end goal of one's desired action or ideology. Rather, it is a question of whether there is a created order, a way things should go, and with it, a question of whether human beings have an intrinsic value and purpose. Neither egoism nor utilitarianism is able to answer these teleological questions satisfactorily. Higher ideals of created order, like intrinsic value tethered to human nature and purpose, human rights, find no convincing grounding within the end goal of majority happiness or self-interest. For this reason, it is far more helpful to speak of consequentialist theories when referring to theories ultimately concerned with consequences or situational outcomes, and to reserve the term teleological purposefully for a deeper moral dialogue, as in whether reality is imbued with a moral order. One can better appreciate the philosophical weight of this term and the notion of an end goal or fulfillment by studying the Aristotelian sense of a final cause. Aristotle famously distinguished between four types of causes, yet when he spoke of an end, a final cause, it was an especially pregnant concept which carried with it everything else, all the other types of causation, and the key to understanding the what, and, especially, the why, of a thing. What is a house? 1. A house is something made of bricks, wood, or some other substance. These are the material causes. They do cause the house to come into being, if they are moved to that end by something else. But this is not a satisfactory answer to the question. 2. A house is an enclosed space, covered with a roof, with partitions separating larger rooms from smaller rooms, doors, areas with plumbing, and the like. This is the formal cause. The house comes to be as it adheres to the blueprint. The design causes the materials to take a particular form. This answer is still not enough, however. A house is more than its rooms, and its overall form is inconsequential to houseness if houses can take different forms. 3. A house is that which house builders build. The builders are an efficient cause, giving motion to the materials and shaping them into their intended form. Of course, while it is true that builders indeed cause the house to come to be, this still does not answer the question, what is a house? It is only when a house is completed, at the very least the idea of a house and the mind of an architect, that one can understand the nature and purpose of a house and thereby answer the question. 4. A house is something which, once completed, provides shelter rest, relief, and privacy. It is only at the end of these other processes that we can understand a thing's purpose. What is Pinocchio? Pinocchio is wood. This is true, but the material cause is not enough. Pinocchio is wood that has been carved in a particular way, assembled in a particular way, and painted in a particular way. Pinocchio is a composite of wooden pieces, carved and painted, connected to one another with bolts and hinges, and perhaps glue, held up by strings which have been fastened to yet other pieces of wood. We might even add that Pinocchio is a wooden thing that has been crafted to look like. It has the form of a boy. This formal cause does not really tell us what Pinocchio is. A Pinocchio is a wooden craft, which Geppetto has created. It is the wooden product of a woodcarver's hand. It is the invention of this inventor. This efficient cause explanation is not enough either. What is Pinocchio? What is the purpose of a Pinocchio? Pinocchio is foremost a puppet. It is meant to function as puppets do. Yet Pinocchio is not the tail of a mere puppet. This puppet was meant to fill a void, to serve as the symbol of the sun for which Geppetto longed. Because of the blessing of the blue fairy, the puppet was enlivened and thus able to serve a different end, as a sun. Moreover, this Pinocchio, though still a puppet, was given a chance to become yet something more. The story of Pinocchio is a tale of two transformations in the final cause, telos, of one mere puppet. The first transformation requires only a change in the efficient cause. Magic, a miracle was needed. The second is a complete transformation in nature. To become a real boy will require additional stuff, and so a moral conscience becomes part of his efficient cause, in addition to the requisite magic, and moral character becomes part of his formal cause. What is a Pinocchio? 
a Pinocchio is a real boy, a moral agent, who was once a mere puppet. According to Aristotle, knowledge necessarily gets at the why question. The former explanations are necessary variables for a complete picture. You cannot have a house without building materials, builders, and a blueprint. Without a final end, however, these explanations are insufficient to answer the question. So too with the question, what is the good? What is morality? An assertion or definition of what seems good, the good, is not enough to speak of the good. Utilitarianism, for example, offers an assertion of what seems to be a good outcome for the majority. Yet utilitarianism does not really answer the question of morality. It only raises the grounding problem and questions about the nature and purpose, the final end or telos, of moral conviction. This is why, again, it would be more helpful overall if people would stop thinking of consequentialist theories like utilitarianism as teleological theories. The resulting ambiguity potentially hinders the real teleological dialogue which needs to take place. Telos is bound up with what a thing is meant to be. Since a goal, meant to be ness, brings with it the idea of hitting the mark, actions, even goals, carry a potential for missing the mark. A pile of building materials dumped on the ground by builders holding blueprints of a house is not a house. It is a deficient example of a house, and the builders have performed poorly. Doing something in the most excellent way, in the case of the builders, or being or becoming what one is meant to be, in the case of the house, is called virtue, excellence. Thus, questions of virtue are inseparable from questions of telos, purpose, which is why Harvard professor and political philosopher Michael Sandel has observed that most political debates are really disagreements over questions of telos. Is abortion good or permissible in most cases? Is transgender ideology correct? Is it true that there is no way it should be when it comes to sex, sexuality, or marriage? These examples of political dispute are not really questions of greater happiness or self-interest. They are questions concerning the way the world is and whether there is an intended order, a way the world ought to be, intrinsic human value, a designated human nature and purpose, an archetype for familial institutions, and a higher moral standard of social expectation for human action. There is something that stands out about virtue ethics, and the question of telos is key both to virtue ethics and to moral dialogue.